Greetings and welcome back to room 303. And we are in your hymnals for freshman English on pages 18, 19, and following. We will be working now with Elizabeth McCracken's Desiderata. Um, we're going to again be doing independent practice, but your textbook company kind of walks you through this independent practice by kind of giving you a sense of where you need to be paying attention, the kinds of things you need to be looking at. Notice at the very top of page 18 we'll be reading Elizabeth McCracken wrote this personal essay. So let's write that down in 2B. This is a personal essay in response to a request from her publisher. The title, Desiderata, means something wanted, needing, or desired. Let's read along together now, and we'll start right away with actually the box 29 on page 18, fact. In her first sentence, McCracken provides a definition, which is a type of fact. Why is this supporting detail important? We'll obviously be asking the question. Desiderata, I learned in library science school, were the items you needed for an archive to make it useful. Useful, not complete, because there's no such thing as a complete archive. There's always a letter out there you want and need, either in someone else's collection or in an attic or just unfound. You need and want things you don't even know exist. That's how collections work. By the way, the term archive here just simply means collection of things from the past, okay? We'll keep reading. I come from a family strong on documents. And by the way, this, again, an observation for examples. Which details in the second and third paragraph support the main idea that McCracken states in the yellow highlighted sentence? In other words, she says I come from a family strong on documents. Let's try and find out the ways in which that's true. I have a small archive myself. My grandfather McCracken was a genealogist. I have his history of the McCrackens, a lovely compilation of research on early ancestors and personal remembrances of his own relatives. My wife, my grandmother, wrote stories and poems. I have copies of those and remember once opening a drawer full of letters she wrote to God, part prayer and part daily correspondence to someone dear. I have my grandmother, Jacobson's collection of family letters. She had 11 brothers and sisters, some who wrote often and some just now and then. I have diplomas of, of relatives I never met. I have diaries and laundry lists. I love anything written by a relative, any evidence of what they really thought. So let's pause for a moment and there's your answer. If she says I come from a family of strong of do on documents, what she means is I have all this stuff from prior experience, especially within my family. And I read these documents fairly regularly. Besides letters from her family, my grandmother also saved letters from Martha, her children's nanny. My mother, who says she had the happiest childhood on record, remembers Martha, and her letters is lovely and slightly daffy. Her twin sister, my Aunt Carol, remembers the letters and the woman as dark and Dickinson, uh, longing for a time that never really existed, right? Uh, Charles Dickens wrote often romanticized maybe a time. I've, I'd always assumed that the truth was somewhere in the middle, but I have the letters and now know that Martha was at best weird. She wrote to my traveling grandmother that the twins, the dollies, she called them, didn't miss her at all. She reported that she took them out to her mother's farm and couldn't understand why the girls were so upset to be served for dinner the chicken they'd met earlier. She reported on the Dollies' toilet training as if it were grand opera and the Dollies' heroines who wanted only desperately to triumph. I'm glad to know this, I think. Certainly, it's a whole different Martha than the one I knew from my mother's stories. I know Martha now because of all that she reveals of herself, not knowing she was doing it in her letters. Top of page 19. Still, there are many frustrations to family papers. First of all, you may learn things you don't want to know. For instance, some of my grandmother's sisters wanted to sue the widow of one of her brothers. Even in letters from the litigious sisters and themselves, this comes across as merely petty and vindictive. There are letters that can break your heart. My Aunt Edna, writing to my grandmother, lamented how poor her health was, how the doctors told her to slow down. I know from the dates that Edna died two weeks later of a heart attack. By the way, notice 31. This is what we call anecdote. Put it in your notes at 2B. What idea do the anecdotes or little stories about the sisters of the narrator's grandmother and the narrator's Aunt Edna help to shape, right? Fleshing out or showing a fuller family. Now, to the next paragraph. But, 
The major frustration is how incomplete everything is, how incomplete people are if you try to meet them this way. Again, uh, the box 32, the observations. How does this observation help shape the central idea of McCracken's work? And then, of course, we'll explain. The great aunt who wanted to sue only happened to write it down. Maybe she gave up the idea. Maybe she was suffering otherwise. Her life was continually tragic in small ways. I know that. Some of the great aunts I barely know because they barely wrote, or rather, I think they barely wrote. My grandmother saved every, le every letter some years and selected letters others. Perhaps those great aunts simply never made it into the collection. And then there's my grandmother Jacobson herself. She was a wonderful and complex woman, an attorney and small business person who died at home at the age of 90. The pieces of paper I have from her don't conjure her up at all. Her diary, which I don't own but have read, is a very careful record of daily events, nothing more. She doesn't detail worries or doubts, and the fact is she was a worried and somewhat doubtful person. I think she knew that we'd read it eventually and didn't want to tell us in her diary anything she hadn't told us already. The fear of self-disclosure, we might say, keeps some people from wanting to keep real full diaries. One piece of paper I do have, a post-it note from late in her life which she used to, make, to mark a recipe in the Jewish cookbook. It says, coffee, beans, bread, milk, wax beans, question mark, and then in the corner written diagonally and underlined, lottery ticket. I know that this dates to a time when she was both worried about money and had become very serious about luck. And again, pay, uh, uh, the number 33 observation. What ideas developed by McCracken's observations about her grandmother's note? Well, again, even from something like a scrap of paper where she's got just some recipe, there's a little comment made there that allows McCracken to begin to kind of flesh out maybe what it is that's going on in her life. I don't know how superstitious she'd previously been, but about two years before she died, she began to see luck as uh, she began to see luck, good and bad, in everything. I'm at the top of page 20. She read her horoscope, her children's horoscope, the horoscope of everyone who might touch her life that day. She believed in fortune cookies. She told her own fortune playing solitaire, and she bought lottery tickets. Not so much because she believed she might win, but because not playing meant she did not believe that sudden good things could happen. She was a business person after all. She knew what a bad investment that weekly dollar was. I love that little green piece of paper. Desideratum to me, uh, scraps of something necessary. Though less than Etheria to anyone else. In other words, uh, that little note means nothing to anybody else, but it means a tremendous amount to her. I could tell dozens of other stories from the pages of family papers. My aunt Blanche's pell-mell record of taking care of her favorite sister Elizabeth, who was dying of Alzheimer's. Blanche was that disease. But Blanche has that disease herself now, and you can see the early signs in these notes. My great uncle's cheery letters from Europe during World War II. A letter my brother wrote to my grandmother when I was four and he was six, thanking her for a gift and then recording that I was resisting writing a thank you note myself. Here's a last story, and point out right beside it, number 34. This is, again, what we call anecdote. Notice, what I did is McCracken refine with this anecdote about her grandfather's love letters. Here's a last story. My father's parents were, when I knew them, quiet people. I now know that my version of them is different from anyone else's, but they were my grandparents, and I never questioned who I understood them to be. After their deaths, I inherited a cherry chest of drawers from their house. I, owed, I owned this imposing piece of furniture for a few years before I lifted some paper lining from one of the drawers and found a letter. Part of a letter actually written by my grandfather to my grandmother before their marriage. It was one of the most beautiful love letters I've ever read, full of delight for her person and for their love together. It was passionate and thrilled and almost disbelieving of his great fortune to have found her. I never imagined my grandfather, my quiet, careful grandfather, was the sort of man who'd write any kind of love letter, never mind this kind, wrong again. And my grandmother had saved it for more than 50 years. I wondered whether she took it out and reread it from time to time or whether she'd forgotten where she put it. My parents were out of town that weekend, and as it happened, I'd agreed to pick them up in the airport. I brought the letter 
to give to my father if it meant that much to me. I couldn't imagine what it would mean to him. And so, sitting on a bench in Logan, an airport, I gave it to him. Look what I found, I said. Oh, he said, perfectly pleased but not surprised. Another letter. I'll put it with the others. Turns out, there were many more. My grandparents had written each other several times a day during their courtship, which makes it, of course, a happier story. My question is, was that letter more a desiderium to me, for me, or my father? He had the collection I didn't. Sometimes I regret giving it to him. I've forgotten the exact words my grandfather used, but it doesn't seem right to ask for someone else's love letter back. Someday I'll see it again, I know. Meanwhile, I need it and desire it. You can see the title here, right? I need and desire everything that belongs to my family, and in some ways I think that's what I do with my days writing fiction. I'm writing love letters to diaries and post-it notes and telegrams and birthday cards. I'm writing love letters to love letters. Of course, on page 21, the central idea in the box 35, what central idea about uh, Desiderata in general and human nature specifically can be supported with the key ideas and details in this work. Well, uh, let's do a quick annotation here at level two and three. At 2A, what is it, the central message or the central theme? Well, there's several that you might write down, obviously. One is the importance of the past, the ways in which we can discover things about other people through the most inconsequential or seemingly inconsequential moments in their life, right? So for example, a recipe, but in the corner it says something about a lottery ticket, which leads one to understand, wow, she was going through a time when she began to really kind of investigate the notion of luck. Not that she necessarily believed she was going to win, but that she at least felt like she had to play for the opportunity of winning. Maybe, you know, getting out of a tight, out of a tight spot. Uh, a second message here is the joy of history. Let's write that one down. The joy of history. Trying to rec recover things from the past because we want to know. Finally, of course, a third observation is made at the very end. McCracken herself asks in this nonfiction piece, why do I write? It's almost as if she recognizes she's going to leave something for future generations. I often ask my seniors as they are getting ready to leave, I have them write a letter to themselves and it's to be read at the age of 50. And what they're doing is they're writing about themselves at that moment, who they are, what they care about, what they want to be. Of course, there is a chance that at some point in the future, they themselves will read the letter. But far more interesting, I ask this question, what if your great, great, great grandson or granddaughter reads this letter someday? Wouldn't it be fascinating to know what your own grandparents or your great grandparents were like the day before or two days before they graduated from high school? if they graduated from high school. Remember the idea of having an education through high school is a relatively new phenomenon in the late 20th century, right? But this notion of the past, if we don't have ways to hold on to it, kind of goes away. At 2B, well obviously here we're working with the central idea, the thesis here is the importance of these pieces of information, this desiderata, this, this, this idea that there's something important that you need to hold on to, especially about family. There is, of course, powerful symbols in this as well. If you had to say what the most powerful symbol is, some students have said it's that post-it note with all that information and then just to the side, lottery ticket, right? It kind of stands, it represents a whole woman's moment in time in her life. Of course, at 3A, we can think about this one. What is for you the text? that tries to explain the importance of the past and holding on, especially within family. Do you have a film, for example, in mind, or a TV show, where understanding about the past and the family of the past somehow helps someone figure stuff out in the present moment in the family, right? The uncovering of information. There have been whole books written, of course, and movies made of stumbling onto one piece of information about somebody in a family in the past, and then you run down the rest of it and guess what? You didn't know everything. Let's jump to 3B. What is for you the thing you want to know about your family and its past that you don't know right now? If you could ask one person who is no longer alive in your family, what would that be? What would that question be as well that you would ask? 
right? Of course, the other question is, what do you think your great, great, great grandkids, don't say you won't have any, that will curse you to have a bunch, right? What do you think your great, 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 great grandkids might say about the very annotation, for example, that you're writing right now? See, imagine that. There's a possibility that someday way in the future, let's say a thousand years from now, the very piece of paper you're writing on may be discovered. What does it say about you? What you've left behind, in other words. Or, notice as in our text, Sometimes people don't want to leave stuff behind. They will destroy things. A classic example of this is the great writer Kafka, who wrote a lot of really famous stories, but right before he died, he asked his best friend to burn all of them. Thankfully, his best friend didn't burn all of them, so we get some of the most amazing stories that are left behind. But why would Kafka want those stories destroyed? Maybe he felt like there were things he didn't want people to know about him. Well, this is at least an introduction. Well, there you go, an introduction to some of the readings at the beginning. We will now turn in a moment here to our first actual text, Washwoman. Thank you. I hope this introduction has been helpful to you.